Hello, everyone who's joining us. It's so good to see you. You are all here for the state of higher ed digital marketing. Thank you so much for joining us today. Some quick housekeeping before we get into it. This panel is going to last a full hour. We're going to spend about 45 minutes going through some content and questions we've prepared for you. Uh, and we've saved about 10 to 15 minutes at the end to make sure we address your questions as well. Now, if you were here last month for our webinar, you know that we'll probably just talk about all your questions as we're going through anyway. We love a good tangent. So if you're not in the chat room yet, hop in, tune that too to everyone. You'll be able to talk to each other. We'll be in there. We'll be chatting with you. And if you've got questions, that's the best place to send them because then we'll all be able to see them. Okay. So we are going to do some quick introductions here because I need to tell you about the amazing panel that I have gathered for you today. Um, we have Day Kibbled, who is the strategist at Ology. They are a marketing and branding agency that's built for education. Now, Day's been working with higher ed institutions for well over a decade now, and she pushes them to use communications as tools for equity and access. She's an international keynote speaker on enrollment marketing, email strategy, productivity, and stakeholder management. And she's the co-author of Mailed It, a book about email coming out this summer with a launch party in Saratoga Springs, New York in August. We are so excited today. <laughs> Maya is joining us too. Maya is your host of The Hidden Gem. And she is the CMO at Carroll Community College in Maryland. Maya has over 15 years of experience in higher education, ranging from leading marketing and retention initiatives and teaching undergrad and doctoral level courses to developing and assessing programs. Maya is also the founder of College Crusader, providing cost-effective social media marketing services and training to colleges. And if you are going to be at the Engage Summit later this month, y'all, there's still a couple days left to register. You're going to be there. You're going to get to see Maya co-presenting on social media at the Engage Summit, doing a lightning talk, and just generally being her amazing self. So hopefully you'll get to meet her there. And last but certainly not least, Artis is the founder and CEO of Element 451 and the host of Generation AI. Element 451 is an ed tech company renowned for its AI-powered student engagement and CRM products. And Artis's expertise spans AI, tech, education, and design. At Element 451, Artis has been instrumental in developing advanced personalization engines and AI features, demonstrating his deep understanding of AI's practical applications. And as an educator at New York University, he shared his knowledge in user experience design, web, and mobile development. Artis is absolutely a thought leader in this field. He's been presenting on generative AI at a number of conferences throughout the U.S. You can catch him at events like AMA, NAGAP, RNL, and NACAG. All right, enough of me talking. Let's get right into our first poll because we want to know what's on your mind today, folks. What is your biggest challenge with digital marketing at your institution? Now, I totally get it. You're looking at these. It was hard to boil it down to just four. And I know you're sitting there being like, can I just tick off all the boxes? I'm forcing you to pick one. So the choices are reaching the right audience, measuring ROI, creating engaging content, and budget limitations. And I can see folks are still answering, so we're going to give them a couple extra seconds. Maya, if you had just had to guess, which one do you think is going to come out on top? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> I, I know for me, it's creating engaging content. So yeah. I'm curious to see how that kind of... All of the above, says Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's share the results. And I think probably as expected, it is a mixed bag, mm -hmm. about 16% saying reaching the right audience. Uh, the winner was measuring ROI. So that's going to be helpful for us to know. But it does seem like creating engaging content and budget limitations are part of the challenge too. All right, I'm going to pull this screen share down because I'd much rather you get to look at everybody's beautiful faces than just a silly slide. And we are going to just dive right in now. So 
As we kick this off, I'd love to give every panelist an opportunity to share their perspective on the state of digital marketing and higher ed. And what I love most about this panel is that we have viewpoints from a CMO on campus, an agency leader, and an ed tech leader. So we're going to get some really great and varied perspectives here. So Day, I'm going to put you in the hot seat. Why don't you kick us off with your view on the state of digital marketing and higher ed? Yeah. So my view comes from having been in this industry for so long. I feel like what the consistent thing that I've seen across different organizations when I myself work there or now as an agency partner is that I tend to see a hyper focus on a single channel or a single tactic. Like we're all going to do paid. We're all going to do this. We're all going to jump to social. We're all going to do uh, you know, a very specific thing that that is hot right now. And that makes sense, right? If if that tactic worked and it helped before, that makes a lot of sense. And it's smart to keep doing the things that work. But I always take it back to like the the foundational definition of marketing. And for me, it's really important that digital marketing is about the right message to the right audience at the right time. And that means that we need collectively to think about being more dynamic and we need to find interesting ways and fun ways to mix up our marketing channels and create a mix that truly reaches and engages people. And so that's, I think, the biggest challenge and, and the current state that I see. Awesome. All right, Maya, you are up next. Okay. Well, they, I completely agree with you that that's the ultimate goal is to deliver the right message to the right people on the right channels. But from my perspective, it almost feels like a moving target. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't be reaching for this target, but it's very challenging uh, to accomplish and to reach. Uh, from a perspective of someone who is working on campus and leading a team and works with digital marketing agencies, to me, digital marketing is evolving so fast and it's becoming so complex and nuanced that it's really hard to manage. Not only the number of channels are growing, but it's also the specialized skill set that's required to manage those, those channels uh, to be effective. Um, and on top of this, the traditional marketing didn't go away. Uh, the traditional channels yeah. are still part of the mix. So in a way, we have added those digital channels on top of the traditional marketing that still works. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing it, but it's just double, triple the amount of work that we should be uh, producing as a marketing department uh, on the college side. And some people might say, well, why don't you outsource? You know, that's a good strategy. And I would say, yes, uh, definitely. If you can find a good partner, outsource. But you still need to have a specialized uh, skill set in-house to be able to manage the agency and to know what to look for and to guide the strategy uh, implementation and to make sure they actually deliver on what they have promised to deliver. So it is becoming more and more specialized. So how does it impact colleges? From my perspective is we need uh, a larger, more specialized staff who is able not to only learn, but also relearn, unlearn on an ongoing basis. So continued education, from my perspective, is key, as well as being more strategic with how we leverage the resources we have. And of course, when I speak to my colleagues at other institutions, uh, it's also important to continue educating and working with your leadership and your campus community to make sure that they know how the landscape is changing and why we are doing the things we are doing, <laughs> uh, because it's, it's changing way too fast and people can keep up. Mm -hmm. Maya, you are hitting some chords. According to the folks in the chat, Kim and Daniela have co-signed everything you just said. And actually, something interesting you just said, you said we have to learn and unlearn. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a yeah. really, that is a really important point. But Artis, you're up. No, I was going to, you know, Maya, spot on. One of the things that you know, we think about when we think about marketing, we sometimes think about advertising and we equate marketing with advertising. And marketing is actually a much bigger area that we should kind of go back to the basic and start thinking about. So when you think about marketing, it's, uh, you know, there's there's the five P's marketing framework, which includes product. So the product is at the center of everything. And usually the customer is buying the product. So that's the most powerful thing that you have in order to differentiate yourself. Uh, price is another really big one. 
And then promotion is in there. But sometimes we just think about the promotion and the place, right? Where do we put the promotion and where do we put the place and the channels? And then last is the people, right? It's like, how do we think about the audiences? How do we segment them? Because different things, are, are, our segmentation is very different. So no wonder is that we're, we're getting inundated and we feel like we're lost because we, you know, we have this um, kind of legacy thinking or, or legacy uh, stuff that we, we've been carrying over and we're not rethinking um, how we are putting forth a product and how we are trying to meet a need on the consumer on the other side. And that consumer is actually changing, right? So that prospective students, they're really behaving you know, more like more like regular, you know, digital consumers, they're seeking value, they're seeking flexibility, um, and, and kind of relevance in kind of their choices. So they really demand fast, convenient, personalized experiences and with with a lot of the brands. And that's where we're sharing their attention. So how do we like that that I see that as a huge, huge challenge that not only are we you know, inundated in thinking about tactics and channels or placement and promotion, but we're also having a moving target because the mm -hmm. expectations of the consumer are changing very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. Can I add something, Aris? As you were speaking, <clears throat> this analogy came to mind that digital marketing is almost like surfing. And I'm not a surfer, but if I were, I <laughs> would probably have how I would feel. It's like, imagine we're standing on this surfboard and the ocean is vast and unpredictable and constantly changing. And we are trying to go against the tide sometimes and those waves coming our way. And I think our goal as marketers is to stay balanced and agile on this board and to mm -hmm. be able to adjust not only to the challenges we are facing, but also the opportunities. So I don't know, I have this visual kind of in my head as a surfer. Nice. Yeah. Nice. And art is something you said about sharing attention. I mean, that's the economy we're in now, right? Like that's yes. the play here. It's all about getting attention. All right. So let's talk about, uh, we've got another poll coming your way. I'm about to launch it. Um, I'm curious what our attendees think in terms of like what technology is going to have the biggest impact within higher ed digital marketing over the course of the next five years. Options I've included are around artificial intelligence for personalization, virtual reality campus tours, influencer marketing, voice search optimization, and AI assistance for student inquiries. Artists, put you on the spot. What would you pick? <laughs> it better you know, be AI artists. Uh, yeah, right? It's, there, yeah, it's a wrong it. answer uh, here. <laughs> that, is, that is the obvious choice, right? And you can say AI. AI is going to amplify a lot of the things that we do, but I want to get back to what Mallory was saying around attention and how do we grab onto attention? And right now, uh, all the digital channels that we're going after, it's all about attention. So influencer marketing, I would say, is probably mm -hmm. one of the biggest impacts that we're we, we're not really piggybacking on right now. So mm -hmm. so influencers are, are grabbing a lot more of their, our attention. They're being even more well, of course, they're influential, but they're being even more influential in decisions that we're mm -hmm. making. So, I mean, I'll go contrary to kind of what I say around AI, which is going to permeate <laughs> everything and lift a lot of boats up, but uh, influencer marketing for sure. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And Laura's in the chat. She thinks people are going to get fatigued from AI and yeah. will be eager for personal through that influencer marketing touch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we. Well, so AI, I wouldn't really equate AI. So AI is... Is kind of a vehicle for getting, you know, content, attention, like all of those things and, and, and lifting all of the different pieces of the marketing um, ecosystem up and making you more efficient. However, it's not going to, um, you know, replace the like, how do I get your attention? Well, actually, the algorithm with I have an episode about the algorithm. But anyway, so we can we can touch base on that next. Yeah, if uh, if someone from the Enrollify team is in the chat and wants to go dig up that episode and drop it in. Just a little call it, to action. It's not next. out yet. It'll be out next oh, week, next oh, Tuesday. Next week, next week. All oh, right, next go subscribe. Fresh. Yeah, sorry. Teaser, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so results from the poll, I flashed them on the screen for a minute, but as maybe we would have guessed, or we did guess, uh, the two AI topics uh, did yeah. rise to the top very quickly, AI around personalization and student inquiries. 
Now, a few minutes ago, we asked you about your biggest challenges. And I, you know, there was quite a mixed bag there, but we're going to, you know, we're going to come back to that for a few minutes. Um, Day, why don't you share some of your perspectives? Because I know from, you know, being at an agency, you get to really see such a broad view of our industry. And I'm curious what you're seeing out there when it comes to digital marketing challenges. So I would say the very first thing that comes to mind and it echoes what Maya and Artis were just saying earlier is the lack of resources. And generally, I define resources as time, staff, budget, you know, all these things, the, the capacity to be able to execute. We are all very, very smart. We are all very, very creative. There's no shortage of ideas. There's no shortage of, of passion and commitment to our work, right? I think truly the challenge is a lack of resources. and. Personally, when I work with uh, clients and, you know, we're building marketing plans, we're building uh, platforms for them to go to market, it's the, the biggest challenge is to understand, okay, what are your limitations? Because the sky is the limit. We could do anything uh, with unlimited resources, right? So I would place that in first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, I completely agree. I think resources are a challenge. And I think unless you are a venture-backed startup with unlimited mm -hmm. capital, uh, you will always have limited resources no matter where you work. So I think for us, the question becomes, how can we use those resources to achieve the maximum impact? Um, and I think it's all about prioritization uh, and strategy uh, and making sure that there is an alignment between what we prioritize, our strategic plan, and our leadership's uh, view. Mm -hmm. So we have this uh, support from the leadership to say no to certain things uh, because limited resources. Um, and I think also limitations like this enable uh, creativity. And that's what I love about higher ed yeah. is anytime you like, I don't know, limited by something. You're like, how can I go around this? How can I do something in a different way? So I don't want people to think that, well, we don't have the resource, we can't do a lot of stuff. I think you can. It's just taking the time yeah. to be more strategic and creative about how we do it. Yeah. And I, I would say one of the ways to do that is focus on, on the things that have big impact, big potential impact with sort of reduced or minimal resource consumption, right? So what are your channels? What is it influencers? Are students generating content for you? And of course, one of the most important things, like, do people even care? Like, are you interesting? Um, do you have brand differentiation? Are the things that you're putting out there worth listening to at all, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things I think we all recognize is that a lot of higher ed institutions sound very similar. Everybody has excellent programs. Everybody has committed faculty. All the communities are amazing, right? Like, it's just, that's true. It's true. Yeah. And so how, uh, one of, you know, how do you rethink how you present yourself out there so that the work you are doing with your digital marketing efforts actually are resonating and creating a, a position in the market of, or in the minds of your market for you? Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. Differentiation is key. Uh, last week, I attended this presentation uh, by an author who wrote a book about uh, little small legends. I'm not sure if you guys read this book, but it's pretty cool. It's about how small companies were able to differentiate themselves because every industry pretty much sounds the same. So how do you stand out? And mm -hmm. I think to be able to know who you are and how you are different is key. But then once you know it, how do you create content around it? And mm -hmm. how do you establish this robust media presence? Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge. I said content creation it's a huge challenge for us because our yeah. audiences are fragmented, channels are growing. So how do you create engaging content that's specialized for different platforms, for different audiences, uh, coordinate those efforts and distribute them in a way that reaches the right audience? <clears throat> um, it, is, it is a challenge. Um, and many people don't realize the time it takes to create content. Uh, I'm sure people who work on campus uh, hear this a lot. Somebody like a program director or a faculty could come and say, hey, can you just post this on LinkedIn? Or can you just post this on Instagram without realizing that there is a strategy behind what we do? And we don't just post. <laughs> we actually think <laughs> about who we post it for, how we present the information. Um, 
out of this frustration, I even created a social media calculator that allows people to see how much time content creation takes for each particular channel. And then I use this calculator to show people when they come to us just to educate them on uh, the amount of time it takes. I'm happy to share if anyone is interested. That sounds but, yeah, amazing. Yeah, it sounds great. Is, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot. Maya, you might want to add one of the things you might want to add to that is the segmentation as well. Because yeah. right now it's like if you add segmentation, it's like, well, you know, we have like 10, 20, 30 different cohorts of segments that can take his message and be personalizing. Then that time, I'm sure it's going to kind of blow up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Or does anything you wanted to add in on digital <laughs> marketing challenges? Yeah, I mean, right now it's look, um we're we're thinking about showing the value when we talked about mm -hmm. that. And the biggest challenge right now is showing ROI. Uh digital has made it really, really easy to see the effect of you posting and having an ad on, on the paid channels and the like what what kind of traffic or kind of interactions, what kind of engagement that drove. We don't always tie that back to uh, the ROI or that student applying or that student uh, sitting uh, in your classroom or, or registering for classes, mm. there is a huge gap in there right now. So, so that's, you know, we have, again, the digital channels that made it really easy, but, but we don't connect those two together to the actual money that's coming into the school or the KPI that the school is using, which is usually enrollment or it's usually some kind of uh, that student participating in a class or or uh, registering for a course. Those two are very, very rarely connected. They're connected at the aggregate saying, hey, I spent this much and I'm getting this many students. Well, there's a lot of things that happen in between. How do you know what's working and what's not working? And and that's a, a huge, huge gap. Mm -hmm. And it feels like the more you can make those connections, right? The more um, power you might have when you're sitting at the table and you are attempting to get more resources. As Maya's already pointed out actually a couple times, uh, digital has maybe double or tripled the workload for small teams. There's folks in the chat who are saying, hey, I'm here team of one. Uh, yeah. And right, like, and and that one person can't, individually scale at the same rate as the workload, maybe. Mm -hmm. And Maya, something you just said, right? Like it just simply takes time to create good content. And not a lot of people really realize or understand, unless they are elbow deep in content creation, um, how how much time it just can take. So when we're yeah. when we are in an economic downturn, when we are in this, I have seen every I don't know, quarter since the pandemic, someone's put out research talking about how hard it is to maintain and retain their staff. I mean, it just seems like we are continuing to operate in an industry where there is such a brain drain and it is really hard to grow teams. So I'm circling around to this mm -hmm. question, but and Maya, I'm going to turn it over mm -hmm. to you because I know you've got stuff to say on this, but you know, what are some actual strategies for managing marketing resources, digital marketing resources during these periods like the ones we're in right now? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the good news is usually during downturn, enrollment goes up because people want to go back to school. So that's, a, that's the good news. But if your marketing department's staff or budget gets cut, and even if it doesn't get cut, I think in general, uh, going back to what Ari said about influencer marketing um, and leveraging your internal staff, faculty, and students, I think is key to amplifying your message and content creation. Um, so I'll share some of the strategies that we use um, at Carol and how we amplify our message is, for one, I see everyone on campus as a content creation uh, person or as an influencer. I don't care if you're like a staff with 10 followers on Instagram, I'll take you <laughs> because you still have the influence over your network, over your social, social network. Mm -hmm. um, and what we actually started doing is training our faculty and staff on how to build their personal brands online um, and how to amplify um, their professional brand, but um, 
indirectly amplifying the college as well, because people see that the college employs engaged, uh, interesting uh, professionals, and they want to, to join the institution and they want to learn from them. And we know that people are more likely to share a personal message than the brand's message on social media. And I think it's like 24 times more likely to share a message that a person posted versus a brand. And it makes sense. We want to engage with people, not brands necessarily. So I would say tap into your staff and faculty as well as your students. Uh, getting the student ambassador program going, I think, is key. And I do know in the beginning it will be uh, time intensive to get those people trained, but over a longer period of time, and that's what I'm talking about, the strategic approach, it will pay off as more and more people are getting on board. And one of the interesting things that I found from those trainings is people come back to, say, to me and say, I didn't realize how much time and effort it takes to create one post for LinkedIn. Like now they're starting to realize, and now we are building awareness and the buy-in from, uh, from the community internally. So anytime you have students, faculty, try to kind of uh, leverage them. <clears throat> and of course, um, in terms of budget, I think a big thing is applying for grants. There's a lot of different grants mm. that you can apply for to supplement what you currently do on the marketing side. Um, and I'm sure you have a grant writer at your institution who can help you identify those opportunities. So don't think just internal. Think where you can bring the money um, from other organizations. Maya, yeah, that's that's very tactical, and that that's spot on yeah. with the with the influencers and the attention. Um, so, from from my perspective, as, as someone who's leading a tech company, uh, uh, I think about a downturn or a reduction in resources or or a market downturn, and I really think it. I think about it as an opportunity rather than as a batting the hatchets and kind of thinking, you know, frugally, right? Um, so when when everybody else is spending less on marketing, um, you should be spending more on marketing. It sounds con it sounds counterintuitive, but it actually uh, it makes your spend give you a better ROI because everybody else is a more conventional thinking. So uh, in our in our case, for example, um, we want to make sure, and of course, this can applies to institutions as well. Um, when that budget gets cut, the first thing that gets cut is marketing. And it's the wrong way to think about it. Try thinking about how do you cut operational components internally? How do you cut things that uh, do not affect the growth engine? Because mm -hmm. if you're affecting the, if you're saving $1 today on your growth engine, tomorrow you're going to be down $1.5. And the next day, it's going to be down $2. And the day after that, it's going to be down $3 because you're not getting the compounding effect of that marketing dollar today. So um, it, it's again, if you think about it that way, that, that dollar that you're spending today, it's going to compound. But if you don't spend it, then you're actually losing that value two, three years down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you have to think about it very differently and now start removing uh, inefficiencies in your operations and putting more towards marketing. And and again, I don't mean marketing. We talked about it's not just advertising, right? It's it's what mm -hmm. Maya is talking about on on programs, influencer programs. Um, you know, how do you find channels and how do you find attention or how do you find places where, <laughs> you know, we'll we'll maybe touch base on this a little bit more. But this idea of um, kind of finding a channel where attention is really cheap. And, and free. Mm -hmm. um, it Reddit. sounds counter. And what's that? Yeah. Reddit. Reddit. <laughs> Reddit. Exactly. Well, yeah. Uh, actually, you know, what's the what's the channel? What is the number one uh, value for attention? Like, what is the number one channel? It's a Super Bowl commercial. So a Super Bowl commercial, even though it costs seven million dollars for thirty seconds, you have a hundred and forty million wow. or or two hundred million eyes on that thing. And if you divide those eyes by the attention that some, your post or your Google is giving you and you're spending that, that is a lot less, um, you know, cost per eyeballs than mm -hmm. uh, your digital advertising that you're spending right now. And of course, that's for larger brands. But if you want to go and think about the ROI for eyeballs and attention, 
that is the highest ROI that you can get in terms of attention and eyeballs. But anyways, we digress. So, so I, just, I just wanted to get back to my original point about uh, trying to spend more on marketing and don't think about it as a downturn, but think about it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I love that you brought up the think about other areas of your institution that you can like not invest in, because this reminds me of yeah. I think it's the most recent Pulse episode um, where with Seth, right, Mallory, I think the one where the program cutting, right? Like if some of your programs are not part of your growth engine, well, I know this is a terribly <laughs> difficult conversation, but yeah. perhaps those, you know, reinvest the dollars that you are investing and in trying to rescue things that are not working for the market anymore and invest them in the things that will help you grow. Uh, another comment I want to add also from an agency friend, uh, Joel Goodman from Bravery, he puts out a lot of content out there that says oftentimes with things like web and, and very specialized skills, to your point earlier, Maya, mm -hmm. it's going to be so much harder for you to find the right talent, skill set, experience, time, et cetera, to bring a person in-house to help you establish uh, whatever you need to establish digitally. And sometimes it's just easier to invest in a partner that can help you do that way faster at industry level quality, right? And so, uh, again, following the same thread that it is counterintuitive to, oh, well, let's invest then. Let's find a partner then. But that might actually be the most cost effective way to mm -hmm. make sure you stay afloat and continue to grow through precarious time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Did, we call it. Go, go ahead, ahead artist. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, we call that um, non-committed. So basically, if you're adding a, a staff member, then you're committing to that. But you have a valve there. If you're uh, if you're hiring a partner, it's like you can you can fire them or you can kind of shorten the contract. And it's um, it, it's a temporary spend rather than a long term mm -hmm. commitment. Mm -hmm. And at right, this point, like that yeah. allows you specialization very very quickly. Yeah, mm -hmm. Maya. Uh, I just wanted to add a comment about Super Bowl commercial because I recently <laughs> saw it. Yes, let's do it. I recently saw a post and I forgot the name of this professor, but he is working for one of the bigger brand institutions. And he was arguing that Super Bowl commercial is not that effective. Um, mm. I mean, not cost effective because he is a faculty member. Uh, he has his own TikTok channel. And he said, well, as a creator, as a faculty creator, I was able to get 200 thousand views on just one TikTok. So that goes back to the influencer idea. If you invest in staff and faculty creators, they could help you get those views and you don't have to invest in the Super Bowl commercial. Um, just, yeah, just a, that. Yeah, I mean, if we can stay on saw. that one, if we can stay on that one, I, I would like to kind of, so um, Gary Vaynerchuk just, just released a book uh, mm -hmm. a week ago, two weeks. It's called Day Trading Attention. So this idea of day trading uh, is essentially think about the stock market, how you find an underappreciated, um, you know, uh, kind of asset and you invest in an asset and then that asset's value kind of goes up. So that's kind of the difference. And that's what day trading is all about. You find something that's lower, it should be higher. You invest in it and it's going to get higher. Well, day trading attention is the same thing, right? It's like mm -hmm. you have consumers and then you have buyers of that attention. So the the digital organic the organic digital media is free right now it is free so it is the cheapest possible channel it will cost you time but it is the cheapest possible way that you can go so when we think about influencer marketing if we can get more eyeballs and more influencers to connect to that messaging or to connect to what kind of what we're pushing that is the cheapest form of it however mm -hmm it gets very um, intricate because the algorithms do not give you that attention, right? They're actually designed right now. The TikTok algorithms are designed to provide that attention to those who are more content that is relevant and that connects better with that end audience. So they're in between and they're saying, no, you can't pay for this. And mm -hmm. you also cannot get in front of all these people because we know we are optimizing for the attention of those people. We're optimizing for them being on the platform. And the only way we can do that is by making and connecting them to content that is relevant, that is engaging, and that is, um, you know, fits really nicely with the context that they're in. So then as a creator, you start thinking, well, 
now I have this, you know, this, how do I get more of those free eyeballs and that, uh, and then how do I create that stuff? Uh, we can go the influencer route because they already have figured that out and now you can piggyback on it. Otherwise you're, you have to build it yourself. So, so very, very interesting model and how we think about it moving forward. But I, mm -hmm. I don't know if we we're going to get there. Sorry for kind of jumping in. <laughs> Wanted to continue the, the I thread. love it. <laughs> I love it. And the best parts of these panels are when we talk about things we had no plans to talk about. And this is like prime example. So I am going to reel us back in, though, because the next topic that we wanted to discuss is around personalization. And it obviously has connections to all the things that we've been talking about for now, almost 40 minutes. Oh, my gosh, these hours fly by, y'all. So when it comes to digital marketing, right, this is this is a key area where personalization is achievable. Um, I think Day said it in her opener that um, it's it can be a little overwhelming. And Day, I'd mm -hmm. like you to pick back up on that. But mm -hmm. um, it, institutions can achieve personalization. And, and I bet, spoiler, some of us will have opinions around how AI helps us do that, because that is a transformational tool that uh, allows even a team of one to get more personalized and more segmented. But Day, I'm I'm going to turn this over to you. Let's 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 go down the the road of personalized content. Let's personalize. Um, so I used to be very very overwhelmed by the idea of personalizing marketing because I think in my mind I used to think it it meant individualized. Like personalized means individualized, and that's definitely a way to think about it. And that's definitely something that's possible with technology today. But what I have learned, or, or I guess learned to appreciate by having been a small team at universities before working at an agency is that it doesn't really have to be individualized to be personalized. And so I like to think about it as you can you consider you can consider your marketing to be personalized if you have done your research about your audiences. If you have created content that is truly connected to their motivations for seeking out your product or service or school or whatever it is, and if within your messaging and within your offer, you are actually giving them the tools and the motivation to reach their goals and their needs. So when they read an ad from you or they open up an email from you, you're talking about things that are so true to the core of why they're pursuing what they're pursuing that it doesn't have to be just to them. You could be sending that to a million people, but you know you're thinking about a need or a motivation that they all share. That's personalized enough, especially for those of us struggling with resources. So I start there and then you can get individualized once you have this solid foundation. Mm -hmm. they, I, um, I completely agree with you. We can personalize content based on our audience's needs. Uh, mm -hmm obstacles, barriers, uh, dreams, frustrations, et cetera. That's why I'm a big advocate for creating personas yeah. to kind of yeah. identify what are they for each of your target audiences. And one segment could have multiple personas, but it really mm -hmm. helps you to get the entire institution on the same page to say, we understand who this particular person is, what challenges they face, and how we should be communicating to them. And to make it easier on content creation, because I'm all about content creation, um, I love taking those personas and uploading them to ChatGPT and asking ChatGPT to help me um, address. So what I do is I create this table with a student journey on top. Mm -hmm. And for based on the persona, I identify what are the questions that particular persona might have during each stage of the enrollment process. And then I upload it to ChatGPT to say, hey, can you help me? Um, address those questions and create content for different channels. And then, of course, we tweak it, edit it, but it's a good starting point to help mm -hmm. you kind of streamline your process. Hey, Maya, I did have a quick question around that. Mm -hmm. So uh, as you start thinking about personas, um, you know, so there is this evergreen topics that, that we feel like we need to post all the time. But then how do you think about your, your take on your institution or your perspective take? Because you, you're basically saying, hey, this is our take, and we're going to apply that to different personas, and that's going to be different for each one of them. Like, are you thinking about, are you thinking about that? Like your, your differentiation or, or your particular take on, on that topic? 
I don't think I understand the question, Arius. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <kidding>. So, <laughs> so I guess my question is like, so everybody starts posting about FASFA and is like, hey, we're yeah. here to support you around FASFA, right? Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, is there a specific, um, you know, something that's very unique to your institution that you want to amplify, right? What makes you different around that particular context or particular topic? So if you have a point of view and, and your institution stands for something or um, is uniquely uh, set up for something, then you have you, you can make a better connection with those audiences if you start personalizing and amplify that particular uh, differentiator. So we can take that for for example. Let's I don't know what was the last uh, thing that you you had posted or, or something that you guys had done about FAFSA. Well, I'm, I guess we can any, stay. We can stay on a we FAFSA can stay example. On, sure. <laughs> um, well, like for FAFSA, for example, what I did is I um, talked to our financial aid office and our students to see what are biggest misconception and what are the barriers to completing the FAFSA application. And then the content that we shared on social media and via email channels to those particular audiences were around those misconceptions to help them mm. kind of overcome the barriers and complete the application. Uh, so some people thought that they would not qualify because their parents are making more money than, you know, yeah. uh, et cetera, or that it takes a long time to complete the application. So kind of addressing those barriers um, or misconceptions. Got it. So my, the only kind of feedback that I would have, or at least that mm -hmm. I, the way that I'm thinking about it is that there's nothing about there about Carol, you know, community college that is unique like that can mm -hmm. be any institution they could be posting mm -hmm. around that particular so yeah uh, so if you have a point of view and and all around those personas and say uh we had a hundred of our students test out the new program and here is uh we figured out that it only took us two minutes mm -hmm. and it took us two minutes to answer this question this question that question so that's a unique perspective that you mm -hmm. can now tie into different it's like a mom you know a parent or a kid so I guess we can like we'll workshop more or like I just <laughs> yeah. I just had that interesting idea because it's like well, how how is it different like you're producing content but how's your content different and what's the point of view uh, yeah. around connecting to that persona? Mm -hmm. I, don't I have a, I have a quick answer to just add to that. I recently did work for uh, one of the in the top liberal arts colleges in the country. And they they had us doing personas because they wanted to understand who are the students who could be coming here that are not currently. And what we found through the personas were both things like one, it's a channel decision. So there are students who normally would not even look for this place because they don't know how. And so they're showing up at the their state college fair or they're going to their school counselor. And, and this top liberal arts college is an, on nobody's radar. Mm. So it changed our marketing in, the, in terms of the mix. Where do we go? What do we do? But it also changes what you put in front of them. Right. So uh, for those types of students. Uh, it was more an explanation of what the liberal arts even is and yeah. why liberal arts at this particular college, it leads you to the outcomes that you want, going back to the RI conversation. Mm -hmm. Whereas the people who are already familiar, so that person, the persona who's already familiar, for them, it's this is the faculty member you're going to work with, right? So all these things are true kind of. about the institution, but uh, kind of the questions and when those questions happen and where they're seeking those answers is really what you can tell is yeah. different through this persona work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it also goes back to who is delivering this message. So hearing it from uh, a current student at our institution has more weight than hearing it from uh, like a financial aid advisor, right? So understanding who should be delivering the message and what channel uh, to what audience uh, would make it personalized in a way, yeah. you know. Sorry, Mallory, we hijacked the order. <laughs> I told you, I love it. No, to Maya, Brett, uh, about 30 minutes ago in the chat said influencers equal authenticity. And right. so, yes, the, you know, who is delivering the message really matters. And as we've already said, like people want to connect with people. And so it is so, it's just so critical to have calls to action to your faculty, staff, students, like everybody is truly mm -hmm. a brand ambassador on the campus. Mm -hmm. um, Artis, I'd love to get your take on personaliz personalization around um, AI usage, and then we'll mm -hmm. move on to our next topic. Yeah, so so AI is really the, uh, the, the biggest uh, 
The biggest power up that AI gives us today around personalization is the ability to actually create content and test them very, very quickly for all these segments and audiences, right? So if we're, if we're on our side right now and we're trying to produce all this content, we say content is very expensive. Well, guess what? Like we can use some of these tools to produce that content as long as we have the framework and what we're trying to do, it can take a content, it can personalize it to different segmentations and, and kind of come up with those different ideas. So you don't have to go to a writer and ask them, hey, can you write me a sequence now for these five different audiences or five different um, kind of segments that we put together? You can take that core message and then modify it uh, for each one of those segments and be a little bit different. So that's the power up that AI gives us in terms of personalizing things. So they said personalization is does not equal uh, individualization or or something to that effect, right? It doesn't mean individualized. It just means that it's relevant to you, and it can be relevant to a group of five. It can be relevant to a group of one hundred or two hundred. It really depends on how you're bringing those cohorts or those groups and how you're figuring that out. So if you have now in the past we we had a group of everybody. <laughs> And AI now allows us to bring those groups smaller, make them smaller and smaller and smaller so we can personalize that content and target and make it more contextual to that group, which we know is going to receive more engagement. It's going to receive, it's going to be more impactful uh, around um, uh, basically those, those eyeball and relevancy. And that's, again, that's what the algorithms and digital algorithms are optimizing for. So it allows you to move things a lot faster, create more content, uh, test things a lot faster. Um, and we only think about AI in terms of the generative AI component, but there's also these algorithms uh, that social media is using for predictive AI on how they're actually getting your attention. What are you clicking? And, and understanding some of that is like, that's changing our attention uh, very every single day, right? Where it's being and where the value is going. So thinking about AI, we can think about it from a from our perspective on content generation, but it's also impacting the spend. It's impacting where your um, your content is being displayed. How many of you have actually posted something and are just getting maybe a handful, like like double digit, you know, um, uh, views or double digit impressions. And it's like, it's sad, but, but the reality is like, you could have put, you know, two hours on that piece and not hit the mark. And the algorithm is, is not, you know, disseminating that. So, uh, so thinking about that is important. So again, AI plays a huge role in it on, on a lot of different areas. And there's a few people in the chat room. Some have sent just us the no, others have sent it to everyone, but they're uh, kind of building on what you're saying, artists, to point out mm -hmm. that the the whole um, garbage in, garbage out theory. Right. And so that just, Thanks. you know, it, could, it is important to know. <laughs> All right. So uh, we cannot talk about digital marketing with day on this panel without turning the attention towards email just for emails i was going to call it one of the oldest digital channels and then i decided <laughs> maybe we call it a seasoned digital channel seasoned expert <laughs> an expert digital channel so day you are literally co-authoring a book on email so yeah. you're going to you're going to be in the hot seat first here um, <laughs> but it, you know we're we're in 2024. We all have inboxes that are ridiculously blowing up. I'm sure just within the last hour, we've all gotten 100 emails from our very favorite brands, right? There's a lot of noise out there. Uh, so to be innovative, to cut through that noise, to get the attention of these prospective or current students, our email marketing tactics have to be engaging. They have to be relevant. So I don't know, give us your um, your book in two minutes. No. <laughs> uh, I've always felt email is like the ugly duckling of mar the marketing mix. And this I feel like that's why I'm so fond of it. Like I want it to be a precious swan. It's a precious swan <laughs> for all of us. And the the one of the reasons is email continues to be this great performing, sturdy, reliable marketing channel, even when we don't treat it with the respect that it deserves. And so uh, what what I like to teach and what the book will be about is how do you get people to actually pay attention to you, want to receive your emails and then be able to see what is in that email very quickly. 
Uh, what I think is most significant about what has changed about email com today compared to maybe when we started using email is the volume, right? Like you just said it, we're getting hundreds of emails every day. Some of them we want, a lot of them we don't. And the time in a day hasn't increased at the same time, right? So more volume, equal amount of time means we have less time to read our email. And Litmus did a test last year where they saw that, I think it's something like 30%, 29.4%, something like that. 29.4% of people only glance at an email for less than two seconds. Like you, you do that. You determine whether it's important or relevant or personalized or whatever in less than two seconds. About 50% read it, read an email but in just two to eight seconds. So you're like, oh, wow, okay. It's not that people are not reading, it's that they have less time to read. So what we have to do is make sure our message gets across in two seconds. And so uh, there's a different, there are ways to, uh, to do that. That's exactly what the book is about. It starts with your subject line. It starts with your from. It's, and then everything that's in that body of that email, if it's relevant and personalized and all the things that we have been talking about, it's going to hit the mark, right? I think a lot of people confuse um, or, or think that in order for emails to get attention, you have to be funny or you have to be clever or you have to be like hook people and try to get, get them to open it and then like tease the content in the email to get them to click. There should be no agenda. Like you should just say what you want to say and and treat this channel like any other digital channel as a way to help your audience toward their goals. And so that's my two minute spiel uh, on my baby email. Hey, I can't I can't wait to read your book because I I love email uh, probably as much as you do, maybe a little less. I don't know, <laughs> but I think it's so uh, in. It's a very effective channel, and yeah. I do think it's underutilized. Uh, and I'll give you a quick example. For uh, At my institution, the marketing department is not responsible for email communications. We have separate CRMs uh, for continued education, for foundation, as well as enrollment, and they send the communications out. But I see my role uh, as a trainer and a coach and to help them understand how they can leverage those emails. So this year, I really try to take the time to do this training for them and to show them how they can improve. Um, one example I'll give you is we have a continuing education uh, department and they send emails out for email for class registration. They work a lot with businesses and organizations for customized training. And by making small tweaks, and I'm saying really tiny tweaks, even like changing a subject line or including some triggers in your email message or um, speaking to their motivations and their desires, like you said, helping them move towards their goals easier. Um, they saw amazing results. The click-through rate increased, registration mm -hmm. increased, and I forgot what it called, but they called it like a Maya effect, <laughs> something like Oh, yeah, I love it. it. Even has a name <laughs> for it. But um, what I'm saying is small tweaks can make mm -hmm a big difference, especially with email communications. Hey, isn't, um, uh, you know, from we're seeing it from kind of a, a writer perspective as well, like even even outside of higher education, the proliferation of newsletters now has mm -hmm, become mm -hmm. even more important uh, because the writers and content creators and, and media agencies, like they're not finding a direct connection. Uh, platforms like Google and Facebook and all this, like mm -hmm. they're removing the direct connection to the audience. So mm -hmm. now we have to go behind those platforms to make a direct connection. And email and newsletters is actually becoming so popular over the last year or so that everybody who's who's a thought leader is actually building up their newsletter list and is still uh, moving back to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody pointed out in the chat a little bit ago about the difference of owning, renting, and buying, yeah, right? And the yeah. different I think platforms. That was Ken. Yeah. Uh, I, mm -hmm. It would make sense that it would be Ken who would point that out. Very uh, smart, Ken. Yes, but the newsletter is a great example of, right, like you just said, Day in the chat, like there's no algorithm that's going to hide your newsletter other than maybe sp the spam rule, right? But, um, but you can own that newsletter and all the content that's inside of it. And in fact, Day's co-author, Ashley Budd, produces one of, you know, the longest running newsletters that I'm aware of that an individual's been putting out there. And it's just consistent and it's great. And 
uh, fun and she gives personal anecdotes. And there was one this morning. So if you want to subscribe, it seems like they might be going to pull that link for us. I did it. (laughs) All right. Last question before we take a couple of the questions from the chat. We'll do a couple plugs for these really cool panelists and the shows that they produce on a biweekly basis, uh, and then we'll be wrapping up. So again, we are going to record to the end. If you got to jump off because we're getting close to the top of the hour, we totally understand. We'll probably run a couple minutes over. But artists, I want to wrap up just talking about the future, right? Assessing new technologies, because we've absolutely established over the course of the last hour that digital marketing is just growing, 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 growing. And in higher ed, we're typically really good about adding more and more and more, but not always cutting the stuff in return that that isn't returning. As those new technologies come out, because we know they're going to, there's going to be a new TikTok, there's going to be a new this or that. The the whole, you know, genesis of AI over the course of the last couple of years, like mm-hmm. some of us didn't see that coming, right? So how would you say as a leader in ed tech, like how should people be evaluating new technologies as they look at what they're already doing and just trying to decide the potential value that it might add to their digital marketing efforts? I mean, I would go back to the basics and and kind of the fundamentals and think about anything that will remove friction between your value proposition and kind of what you're trying to say in your messaging and your product. And that consumer actually contributes uh, net positive to, to their experience and actually amplifies the opportunity for that student to convert or their uh, that consumer to convert. So any technology that does that, you know, uh, should you should really look into it. And and when you think about it, um, there is there's a few technologies that we've seen recently. Uh, of course, uh, kind of AI providing a more personalization to kind of uh, com- make that messaging and make that that experience more more personalized. As we spoke about all this all this time, uh, when you think about uh, Google. Uh, two uh, two weeks ago, Google announced what they call Google AI overviews. And essentially what they're doing is saying, we want to remove the friction of somebody clicking on that blue link and going to a website where they now have to read the whole uh, page in order to find their answer. And they're providing you a generative AI experience. We're also seeing that chat GPT has become, or, or a Gemini or all these chatbots have become a source of information. And that's how people are getting that information. So we see that uh, your website is the number one source of information for your audiences. So try to implement and do the same thing on your website. Try to think about somebody coming in there rather than you sending them to this really long path to find that information and, and digest it. Why don't you just provide them with an experience so they can just ask a question and get that answer right away or, or drive them through a path to do that? And, and AI can provide a lot of that, right? We can we can provide a lot of that. And at the same time, why don't you provide a 24-7 assistant that can help them do some of the things that usually take friction by going through a different channel or going through an email or, sorry, they, but sometimes those emails take a really long time to come back to us when you send them. Um, so, so having that 24-7 experience, it, it's also relevant uh, as part of it. So focus on your properties, focus on your content, and, and focus on removing that friction uh, as much as possible. Just focus on the things that you own because Google is going to change the game and, and a lot of that is going to be uh, towards taking attention and bringing it to those platforms rather than um, sending them to you. Yeah, yeah. All right, folks, we are at the top of the hour. I'm going to launch one more poll. We want to know if you would recommend a future Enrollify webinar to your colleague based off of today's session. I'll let that run for just a moment. And while I am, I'm going to get a couple more slides up. All right. Ah, looks like an overwhelming majority do indeed think that they will recommend future Enrollify webinars. So thanks. And guess what? There will be more. So look forward to that. Appreciate it. All right. So quick plugs, because the folks that you just heard from over the course of the last hour, you can listen to them on a weekly or biweekly basis. And there is a whole host of content Uh, They are all podcast creators on the Enrollify network. Dane Kibbles runs Talking Tactics. It is a show that's devoted 
Uh, every episode devoted to a single tactic that moves the needle on an enrollment metric, whether it's an inquiry, a booth visit, an app completed. The podcast just focuses on one single tactic from idea to results. And hopefully what you hear will encourage you to go and try something fun and new yourself. Maya is hosting one of the network's newest podcasts, The Hidden Gem. This is focused on empowering community college presidents, leaders, marketing professionals, communication professionals with the knowledge and insights to harness the full potential of strategic marketing and communications within their organization. And artists host one of our fastest growing podcasts, Generation AI. It is all about artificial intelligence. It's a groundbreaking podcast that he co-hosts and uh, exclusively for higher ed. So artists is taking and sometimes even launching like bonus episodes in the middle of the week. He's taking all the stuff that's happening in AI and he's distilling it down so that it is easy to digest and understandable and within the context of a higher ed pro. So I highly, highly recommend it. Uh, in fact, artists recently did a webinar talking about one of AI's newest advancements within Element 451 called Bolt Discovery. This is a game changer for your website. You can scan that QR code if you want to get direct access to the webinar. But don't worry, we've been collecting all of the great tools and resources that have been talked about in the chat room all the tools and resources I've told you about, and we're going to put it all together in an email with this panel recording for you. Hopefully that'll hit your inbox tomorrow, if not tomorrow on Friday. And it is indeed Friday is your last chance to register for the Engage Summit, and you will be able to see many of your favorite Enrollify creators on the stage the theme of the summit this year is AI Got You. It's taking place in Raleigh later this month. And we are just super, super excited and hope that we'll get to see many of you there. All right, folks, it goes by so quickly, but we really appreciate all of your time. And we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar, which will be taking place in July. Stay tuned. We will send you an email about that soon. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.